Good morning. Thank you for joining our ACME seminar today. Uh, today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Shengyan Yang, who is an associate professor at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Dr. Yang is originally from the city of Nanjing. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science uh, from the University of Hong Kong in 2005 and PhD from UT Austin in 2011. Um, he worked as an imaging geoscientist in uh, CGG US Services, which is a geoscience services company in Houston from 2011 to 2013. He joined Singapore University of Technology and Design in 2013 and is currently an associate professor there. His research um, focuses on uh, theoretical condensed matter physics with particular emphasis on the topological aspects in condensed matter systems. Um, Dr. Yang, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you, Iger. Uh, yeah, it's, it's my great pleasure to uh, give this uh, presentation of uh, some of our research works. Uh, I would like to thank uh, James and uh, Iger for the invitation. Uh, I also apologize that uh, my camera has some problems so you cannot see my face. <laughs> um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, this, um, uh, this topic which is uh, a normal uh, spatial shift in interface reflection. This is uh, uh, actually a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, this uh, first is a acknowledgement. Uh, these uh, works are mainly done by uh, these two guys. Uh, Liu Ying is my former PhD student. She currently joins the Hebei University of Technology in China. And uh, Zhi Mingyu is uh, my postdoc former postdoc and uh, he is currently working in Beijing Institute of Technology. And uh, we also have some um, collaborators listed here. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. I shall first introduce uh, the background uh, and then talk about uh, uh, two aspects of this uh, phenomenon. One is uh, the shift discovered in energy reflection uh, the other one is uh, the quantization uh, of uh, this uh, interface shift. So, so first of all, this uh, uh, phenomenon has a, an analogy in the optics, which is well known. Uh, actually, um, let's, if we review the basic law of reflection, we will imagine there is a light beam incident on the interface. So here, this uh, red color of the surface is an interface. So you shine a light beam on the surface and as the interface, the light will get uh, reflected and also refracted. Uh, so according to the laws of reflection, which is basically the, the, some basic knowledge uh, we have in middle school in physics class, then you know that so the light beam will get reflected and this uh, reflection angle will equal to the incidence angle. Uh, and uh, when Actually, an implicit uh, assumption um, is that uh, the, this reflected beam is uh, actually outgoing at the same point of this uh, incident beam. So, so this uh, incident beam coming and reflected at this point, right, at this point. But actually, this uh, is not necessarily true. Uh, people know that there is a, a possibility that uh, the light beam may have a uh, a longitudinal shift along this uh, uh, interface and also within this uh, plane of incidence. Uh, so here we could have this beam uh, outgoing at a point different from this uh, point of incidence. So this uh, longitudinal shift is known as the Gauss-Henschen shift or Gauss-Henschen effect uh, predicted long ago in this uh, work. And uh, uh, actually it's not that uh, strange because you can imagine the light beam uh, after it hits this interface, it may propagate along the interface for a while and then get reflected. Uh, so you can have this kind of uh, uh, picture. Uh, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, more strange is another effect which is uh, called the Inbert Federov effects where this uh, whole incidence plane will have a, a shift. 
So the inside beam is again, uh, again this, uh, this red arrow. And after uh, it's reflected, uh, the outgoing beam actually is raising a plane which has a, a transverse shift with respect to the original plane of incidence. Now, so you can see these two shifts are perpendicular to each other. And this one is known as the inverse factor of shift. Um, so this is uh, this effect actually has a when when it's first predicted, uh, there is a condition that this beam is uh, circularly polarized. Uh, so so if you have a circular circularly polarized light, it will have this kind of uh, uh, inverse factor of shift. And uh, actually, the circular polarization suggests that this has something to do with the uh, uh, spin orbit coupling for this light beam, uh, because uh, the circular polarization is like a spin for the photon. So uh, actually, uh, many works, uh, I think in the last uh, 30 or 20 years, uh, is to, uh, to expose this uh, uh, spin orbit coupling for the lights and uh, the reinterpret this uh, uh, inverse factor of shift using the photon spin up the coupling. Um, and uh, this effect also has been demonstrated in experiments like this experiment in uh, 2008. Um, they measured the uh, transverse shift in this uh, refraction process. So actually, the, although here I illustrate the effect in reflection, but this effect also happens for refraction. So the refracted uh, light beam can also have this transverse shift. So all these are well known in the context of optics. Uh, so uh, this theory, you can calculate all these shifts using the Maxwell's equations and it, uh, its prediction also gets uh, uh, confirmed by experiments. Uh, another natural question is, is there a similar effect uh, that can happen for electrons, or can happen for other particles. Uh, actually, we have uh, um, something similar, actually also predicted long ago, uh, like uh, in this uh, paper, uh, but G predicts this uh, so-called side jump effects. So what it means is an uh, electron, if you, if you uh, imagine this electron is described by a wave packet, now, when this electron hits uh, some impurity in the, in the material, then the outgoing wave package may have a, a side jump, so-called side jump, basically is a, a shift of its uh, center of mass uh, uh, of this outgoing trajectory with respect to the incident trajectory. So this uh, side jump effect actually is one of the uh, mechanism for the so-called anomalous Hall effect in the magnetic materials. And, uh, um, this uh, has been actually been a, a very interesting topic uh, for the study in condensed matter physics uh, over a long period of time. Uh, this one is basically uh, very similar to the so-called Gusshansen shift in optics. And uh, indeed, uh, many works um, like in the last 20 years has been focused on the Gusshansen like shifts in various electronic system, like in the two dimensional electron gas. Now uh, people study how to uh, utilize this uh, shift to uh, realize certain functions. And also in graphene, people find the uh, Gusshansen like shifts can be enhanced by the graphene pseudo spin degree of freedom. Uh, and they, they can design some waveguides that can enhance this uh, tension like shift. And uh, for the inverse factor of like shift, that's the transverse shift, um, its uh, discovery is, uh, or its uh, report is much later, actually later than the tension like shift. It's in 2015, there are two independent works reports this uh, transverse shift uh, in well sign metals. Um, so this actually, uh, we did one of the work here. Uh, the idea is uh, very simple because uh, if you look at the dispersion relation for YO electron, uh, it's uh, very similar to that of photon. Photon, you have this light cone, right? So it's uh, linearly dispersing. 
for your vial, electron is similar. So basically in, in vial, so-called vial side metals, it's uh, you have a band structure near the Fermi level described by this uh, uh, like vial cones. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's similar to graphene. You have this linearly dispersing uh, bands. Um, and uh, here the dispersion can be captured by a, a vial Hamiltonian. Yeah, so you have K dot sigma. Sigma is a, a polymetrisis. And here we have a chi stands for the chirality. So you can have this uh, being uh, plus one or minus one. So it correspond to left-handed and right-handed right uh, vial fermions. And for this, uh, for this uh, uh, kind of uh, dispersion, it's very similar to that of photon. So you can naturally expect there will be something similar. And uh, we can have a, a, a very simple uh, argument for the existence of this uh, uh, transverse shift uh, by using the conservation law. Now, so if you consider such a simple setup, so here we have a vial side metal on the left hand side. The right hand side is also a vial side metal, but you have a, a potential step. So considering you like you can um, do a electric gating or just uh, or by doping or something, you can create a potential step. So this uh, will create an interface, this, rec this green colored one. And you imagine there's a vial electron beam incident on this, uh, this interface. And for the whole system, uh, actually there is a uh, emergent uh, 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 rotational degraph, rotational symmetry. Now, because you, you like look at this Hamiltonian, uh, although the real system does not have a continuous rotational symmetry, but in the low energy regime, so if you just focus on the uh, focus on the energy within a small window around this uh, uh, vial point, then this Hamiltonian actually has an emergent uh, rotational symmetry, uh, and uh, this rotational symmetry is along the z direction. Therefore, we have a conserved uh, angular momentum, which is uh, the z component of the total angular momentum. It consists of two parts. One is the orbital part. Basically, it's just the R cross K. The other one is the spin angular momentum because here this Hamiltonian has a spin one half degree freedom. Um, so this, uh, this uh, uh, Z component of total angular momentum must be conserved. And uh, if you look at the spin, now this, uh, Direction of this n, n is a unit uh, vector along the uh, along the, the uh, spin direction, spin polarization direction. And uh, since here this uh, vial Hamiltonian is uh, actually uh, manifests as uh, perhaps the strongest spin orbit coupling, you can see the v vector is uh, is uh, tied to the uh, direction of the spin. Uh, so the two must be parallel for uh, 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 energy eigenstates. So this uh, direction of the spin is tied to the wave vector direction. And if you look at this, uh, uh, this uh, wave vector for the incident uh, electron and the reflected electron and the transmitted electron, you can see they are not aligned. Now, because uh, here, if we assume the um, the interface is infinite along the transverse direction, then clearly the, any wave vector uh, parallel to the interface must be conserved. Now, so here we should have uh, uh, all these uh, electrons uh, momentum parallel to the interface conserved. Now, so here this uh, K for the incidence and the transmitted and the reflected electron will not be aligned. So this means the spin angular momentum, this part will also be different, now different among these uh, three. And uh, clearly, because we see that this uh, GZ is conserved, so any change in the spin angular momentum must uh, be accompanied by a corresponding change in the orbital angular momentum, such that the two are compensated uh, to, in order to make sure this GZ is conserved. 
So this is a reason for the shift because if you have a, a, any change in this uh, orbital part, it will make a, a shift along the transverse direction with respect to the incident plane. Yeah, so, so this uh, this argument is actually quite uh, quite a straightforward. And uh, by directly using this uh, symmetry arguments, you can calculate uh, the shift. Yeah, so here, this uh, this one is the incident uh, electrons plane, uh, plane of incidence, and this is uh, the reflection plane and it's, and the plane for the transmitted electron. And you can see there is a transverse shift between these planes. And uh, here I denote this one by the, the delta y r. The, the transverse shift for reflected electron. And, and uh, from the simple symmetry argument, you can get this expression uh, for, the, for the shift and also for the shift for the transmitted electron. And uh, this can have a, a observable effect because, uh, uh, yeah, one, one thing I need to point out is you can see the shift is. Uh, uh, depends on the chirality of the electron. So here, um, all, the, all, the, all this expression carries this chi. Chi stands for the chirality of the wire electrons. So uh, in a wire side metal, you have both the right-handed and left-handed wire electrons. So this, this indicates that they will uh, move in opposite uh, directions. So imagine you can make a junction like, uh, like this. Uh, so here you, you, you have a, a interface which uh, makes uh, a finite angle with uh, the uh, electron flow. So suppose the electron flow is along this z direction uh, from left to right. And you have the interface makes a finite angle theta with this uh, uh, electron beam. Uh, then the uh, uh, one chirality, the electron with one chirality will be shifted uh, upwards and the opposite chirality will be shifted down. So we can actually using this very simple setup to separate so the uh, wire electrons with opposite chiralities. So that's uh, the, the background of, of this uh, uh, whole discussion. And uh, uh, so we noticed that there is a very strange, so very strange uh, uh, reflection process. Uh, so that's uh, the energy refraction, which happens in the interface between the normal metal and the superconductor. So it's, uh, it's a strange in the sense that uh, if you have some incident uh, particles, outgoing particle is, uh, is of different type. Uh, because uh, the, in the energy refraction, where you have an uh, electron hits this uh, interface between uh, metal and the superconductor, uh, the electron may grab another electron to go into the superconductor together. So they, they form a Cooper pair. And uh, because uh, there is a one extra electron grabbed into this uh, superconductor, so there is a, a hole. Uh, actually, the reflected particle is a hole that uh, go from this interface. And uh, this um, uh, natural question is, uh, can we expect any shifts also in this uh, energy reflection? So here, the incident particle and the outgoing particle, these quasi particles are of different types. They are of opposite charge. So uh, at the first look, this, uh, it may seem that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it will be well revealed to have a, a, a shift because uh, the two particles are of different types. Uh, but actually, there can be such an effect. Uh, before addressing that, uh, let me also introduce uh, the, the uh, theoretical approach that we can study this uh, shift. Uh, the most uh, general approach is a uh, so-called quantum scattering approach. So this is uh, uh, this is uh, like uh, uh, the most uh, general approach. So basically, you model a, a beam of uh, uh, particles. Uh, by using this, uh, um, uh, by using a, a partial wave expansion. So here we may expand uh, uh, our beam uh, by using the eigenstates of, uh, of one of the regions. Uh, so these are the partial waves and uh, this W stands for the profile of the beam. Uh, then for each uh, partial wave, you can calculate uh, its uh, reflection amplitude and uh, also transmission amplitude. 
Uh, therefore, the outgoing beam can be expressed in this way. And then you can compare the two beams uh, and compare their, um, their uh, 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 so consider their uh, relative shift uh, along the interface. Uh, so from this, you can calculate both the cotension like shifts and also the inverse feather of shifts. So this is the most general approach. Uh, actually in the uh, optics, uh, people also use this uh, same approach to calculate uh, the uh, cosentric shift and the inverse feather of shifts for the EM waves. And uh, uh, the second approach is um, uh, the semi-classical approach. So here you can uh, model each uh, beam as a beam of uh, wave packets. And for each uh, uh, electron wave package or whole wave package, you, you can find that uh, their dynamics follows uh, a set of semi-classical equation of motion. So you can write down uh, very similar to the Hamiltonian's equation of motion. You have this uh, um, the, the time derivative of the position and, and also of the momentum. So you can track the uh, dynamics in phase space. And uh, from this, you can calculate uh, uh, the evolution of a, a, a wave packets when it's uh, uh, undergoing a, a scattering process. And uh, actually in this work, in our previous work for the uh, electron in wires and metals, we actually used this approach to calculate uh, the shift. And uh, uh, very interestingly in this approach, you can clearly exhibit the connection of this shift with the so-called barrier curvatures, uh, barrier curvatures in, in momentum space and also in phase space. Uh, so barrier curvatures are related to barrier phase. It's like uh, some artificial gauge fields uh, in, the, uh, in the phase space. So, and this uh, also agrees with uh, the results we obtained from the symmetry arguments. Um, and uh, this uh, approach has uh, some limitation because uh, we need to model the beam as uh, a wave package and uh, all these uh, dynamics of the uh, um, semi-classical dynamics uh, will require the condition that uh, the uh, external uh, potential, the profile must be uh, slowly varying. So if you have a, a very sharp interface, actually the assumption for this approach uh, will break down. So this basically can only apply when you have a, a, like a very uh, smooth uh, interface uh, and the, the electron are gradually um, uh, changing their trajectory in this process. And the third one is a symmetry arguments I have, I have already mentioned. Um, so in th this is actually a very powerful one. If your system do have a, a certain symmetry, uh, which means you find a, a, a operator that commutes with uh, the, uh, the Hamiltonian of the system. And then you can argue that uh, the conservation of this, uh, of this uh, so-called angular momentum uh, will satisfy this re relation. Uh, so incident beams, uh, uh, angular total angular momentum will equal to the uh, total angular momentum for the reflected beam. And from this, you can get uh, the transverse shift if there is any. Uh, so this uh, is uh, very powerful in the sense that uh, it's independent of the interface details. So no matter whether you have a, a, a graded interface or you have a sharp interface, as long as there is a, a symmetry conserved, then you can apply and get the same results. So we apply those uh, uh, approaches to study this uh, problem. Uh, that is the, the shift in the process of entry reflection. So we consider, let's first consider the transverse shift yeah, because this is uh, the more uh, non-trivial one compared to the longitudinal shift. And also this is a, a more well-defined shift. So we consider the, uh, several models the first model is a vial same metal on the left hand side. So the normal metal part is a vial same metal. And on the right hand side is a, uh, is a, is a, is a superconductor. So for this part, so we actually use the same Hamiltonian as the left hand side, just to add a power potential. 
in the BDJ equation. And we can use the first approach that is the scattering, uh, quantum scattering approach to calculate, directly calculate the shift. And indeed we find there is a transverse shift in the entry re reflection process. Now, so here are these uh, angles are the incident angle and the reflection angle as illustrated in this figure. And uh, these Vs are the parameters in the Weyl Hamiltonian. Um, so to uh, actually we can have a very uh, intuitive understanding of these results, again, by using the symmetry arguments. So for the uh, model, if we impose a condition that is uh, Vx equals Vy, so the Vs are the, um, the Fermi velocity parameter in this uh, Weyl Hamiltonian. So if you impose a condition Vx equals Vy, then clearly this uh, Hamiltonian has a rotational symmetry along the z direction along the z direction. So again, we can see the z components of this angular momentum, of this total angular momentum is conserved. So from this, we can, we can trace the change in the spin angular momentum part. And uh, here, as illustrated in this figure, we can see that the incident electron has a spin angular momentum pointing in this direction. And for the outgoing, Hole, it actually has a direction it was described by this arrow. And clearly, their Z component has a difference. No, they are different. Therefore, uh, this difference will, um, will also um, be accompanied by a change in this orbital part. Uh, and from this, we can directly get uh, expression for this uh, transverse shift, and which agrees with uh, the previous result we obtained using the scattering approach. And uh, here we, we choose uh, some, some realist, realistic uh, parameters. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, the size of this shift can be uh, on the order of like uh, 100 nanometers. This is quite sizable. And uh, in this analysis, we used uh, the model for a while uh, same metal. So you may ask, uh, is a uh, wild same metal a, a crucial condition for the appearance of this shift? Uh, to answer this question, we choose another model. So here we we get a model uh, like this. So it's, it's just a some, some artificial model. Uh, but here, this uh, we notice that depending on this uh, value of this uh, parameter n, we can have two types of band structures. When this n is um, uh, negative, you have uh, this side described by a uh, uh, wild metal. You have two wild points. But if you have this n being positive, then the left hand side is a kind of semiconductor. So there is a gap, and there is no wild points at all. Uh, but uh, you do have this uh, spin optic coupling because here this uh, sigma is uh, like spin, and uh, you have this. Uh, momentum, right? So you have spin optical coupling. Uh, and the right-hand side, for the right-hand side, we just uh, choose a model of a free electron gas plus SV pairing. So there is no, uh, nothing strange on the superconducting side. And we, again, do the analysis using like a quantum scattering approach and also symmetry arguments. You can find there is uh, also a shift now, there is also a shift, and this can be understood from the change in this uh, spin angular momentum. Yeah, so, so there is indeed a shift. Therefore, this uh, uh, answers the question that uh, the wild sand metal is actually not necessary for the appearance of this effect. And uh, from this analysis, we see that actually the, one of the important ingredients is the spin optical coupling on the normal metal side. Uh, because in this uh, in this model, on the superconducting side, we do not have any spin optic coupling. The spin optic coupling appears in the normal metal side. And uh, from our, our arguments, you can see that the spin optic coupling is uh, crucial uh, because uh, uh, only if you have that, you can transfer the change in the spin, op spin angular momentum into the change of uh, orbital angular momentum. So these are the two conclusions we learned from this uh, model study. And uh, um, 
this is uh, our one of our first work on this uh, uh, on this uh, effects. And uh, this uh, there is also some questions remaining from this study. Uh, here we choose uh, all, in all this model study we choose the S wave pairing. So you may naturally wonder what is the effect of uh, uh, like unconventional pairing if you have a P wave or D wave pairing. Will this have any um, produce any distinctive effects on, on this uh, um, in this phenomenon? Uh, the second question is uh, is the spin up coupling really necessary for the effect to happen? Uh, so these are the two questions. And uh, we subsequently we did uh, another study by just uh, choosing on the left hand side, we just uh, use uh, the, the simplest uh, model, which is uh, just a free electron gas described by this Hamiltonian. And on the right hand side, we choose uh, 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 also a simple Hamiltonian, but with unconventional pairing. Uh, and we do not include any spin up coupling on the side. So these are the setup. And uh, the important thing for unconventional pairing is that uh, the uh, pair potential or the gap function has a uh, momentum dependence, has momentum dependence. So uh, this uh, summarizes our results. So we consider several kinds of uh, pairing, uh, like a chiral, P, chiral um, type pairing and the P wave pairing, D wave pairing. And we do the calculation. And uh, indeed uh, you find uh, uh, generally there will be a shift. Generally there will be a shift. And more importantly, for different pairings, uh, they manifest uh, different features. Uh, so this I will discuss in detail uh, in a while. So here is this uh, illustrates the setup. So we consider uh, this, this part is uh, modeled by the uh, uh, free electron gas. And uh, the uh, lower side is uh, some unconventional superconductor. And here we have a uh, electron beam incidence on the interface. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this beam has an incident angle described by this gamma and also uh, because of, uh, for unconventional pairing, generally there is a, a, a dependence on this uh, uh, azimuthal angle. So here we also uh, need to specify the direction of this beam in this uh, incidence plane. So this is specified by this angle alpha. Uh, alpha is, uh, is actually the direction of this uh, plane of incidence. And uh, the outgoing hole, uh, can have a, a transverse shift uh, described by this L from this plane of incidence. So this is a shift we are interested in. Now this is, this is actually a top view of this picture. And uh, we first consider the uh, chiral P wave pairing, uh, for example, then this chi will be plus or minus one. Then we find that uh, this shift is actually uh, a constant independent of this angle alpha. Uh, so it's actually isotropic in this plane. Of course, this is for a simple model. Uh, and uh, its sign actually depends on the chi. Uh, so this is somewhat uh, anticipated uh, because you have uh, a different chirality. Uh, the shift should uh, depend on this chirality, right? For, so one chirality is uh, shift is positive, the other, other for the other chirality is shifting the opposite direction. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, given by this very simple result. And uh, again, this can be understood by from the symmetry. Uh, so here for the chiral, uh, chiral P wave pairing, we again have a, a rotational symmetry along the Z direction, uh, along the Z direction. So we can have this, um, Angular total angular momentum operator written in this in this way, and uh, please note that this uh, is a uh, effective uh, uh, effective uh, uh, angular momentum in in the sense that this uh, is operator commutes with our effective Hamiltonian. So this one is a uh, is some emergent symmetry that only emerges in the low energy sector. So from this we can calculate uh, the shift. And uh, indeed, it recovers the results we obtained from the quantum scattering approach. 
one very important point here is that the spin parts. So if you look at these spin parts, this spin tau is actually not is not a real spin. It is actually the spin correspond to the electron hole space because here we are dealing with the PDG Hamiltonian. So uh, we naturally have this uh, electron hole sub uh, electron hole space or you know, also called the Nambu space, right? So this uh, tau is uh, actually the Nambu pseudo spin. And uh, for this uh, uh, Nambu pseudo spin being pointing upwards, now uh, if it's, uh, it's pointing upwards, it stands for the electron, when it's pointing down, it's a hole. So in the energy reflection process, we have incident electron and outgoing is a hole. So therefore this Nambu pseudo spin will flip sign. So you, you flip from uh, uh, electron to a hole. Therefore, you can have this change in this uh, effective spin angular momentum. And this transfers into a change in the orbital angular momentum and causing this uh, transverse shift. Uh, so, so this is indeed a, a very interesting effect. So now the, the spin is an effective spin you know, in the Nambu space. And uh, this um, shift is due to this, uh, this uh, so the flip of identity from electron to a hole, right? So from this actually, you can also see that if you if you if you consider the normal reflection, which means the electron reflected the electron, then this uh, there is no change in this angular momentum. Therefore, the shift is zero, right? So this uh, is uh, uh, actually uh, only happens for the energy reflection. And. Uh, uh, since uh, um, uh, the, mo the most important unconventional superconductor is uh, uh, the D wave superconductor, the cupris, right? The, because currently, uh, I guess, uh, 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 there is a, a still, although there is a still some um, controversy, but uh, uh, most evidence uh, show that uh, the high TC superconductors are, are of this D, uh, D wave. Of this kind of D wave, so we choose a model uh, with uh, this um, D wave pattern, and uh, did the calculation using the quantum scattering approach, and we find a uh, uh, very interesting results. So it's uh, given by this expression. So remember, this alpha is the uh, angle of this uh, incident plane with respect to some some crystal axis. Okay, uh, this. Uh, we also have a step function. So this theta is step function. And uh, the step function uh, of, uh, uh, of two terms, the, the one, first one is uh, uh, the gap, the superconducting gap in the direction of the, uh, of the incidence, uh, incidence direction. And uh, the second one is the excitation energy of this uh, electron. So from these results, uh, we can see several features. One is uh, uh, as a function of this uh, angle alpha, uh, we can see the shift exhibits a period of uh, half pi, and uh, it flips sign at uh, multiples of uh, uh, pi over four. So you have this kind of uh, uh, periodicity. periodicity. Uh, so this actually characterizes uh, this uh, P wave pairing, uh, D wave pairing. And uh, from this uh, step function, you can see that uh, the shift is uh, entirely suppressed above the superconducting gap at uh, the incidence direction. So these are characterized by this uh, uh, green colored zone in which the shift vanishes uh, completely. Now, so whenever you have this uh, excitation energy, energy of the uh, of the electron beam above this uh, superconducting gap, then the shift will vanish. And uh, therefore, now because for D wave pairing, the superconducting gap is uh, is uh, has this kind of pattern, so it has nodes uh, in this uh, forty five degree direction. So actually, the nodes in this graph, the nodes correspond to the center of this uh, green colored zone. So this uh, we call the suppressed zone. So, so actually, if, if uh, one is able to map out this uh, angular dependence, actually we can um, get the extract the, the position of this uh, superconducting nodes from this uh, from this diagram. 
And also we find that the shift is suppressed when the uh, incident uh, beams, uh, uh, with incident beams, uh, uh, wave vector is away from this uh, uh, superconducting Fermi surface. Now, of course, on the superconductor, there is no Fermi surface, uh, but uh, originally, before it becomes superconducting, before it becomes a superconductor, uh, there is Fermi surface. So whenever this, uh, uh, the beam of the, uh, the wave vector of the incident beam is away from this, uh, uh, so, uh, of this, from this Fermi surface, then the shift will become suppressed. Now, so, so in this, in this diagram, this is uh, the normal metal side, this is superconducting side. So here we can imagine we can have a, a very large Fermi surface on the normal metal side. So some of the incident uh, uh, particles can have a, a transverse momentum that's away from this uh, uh, Fermi surface of the superconductor. And in this green, green colored region, you can see the shift will be suppressed. And uh, of course we know that uh, in culprits, the uh, the Fermi surface is uh, of this um, uh, cylinder type. Uh, so it's, it's more like cylinder because it's uh, highly anisotropic along the uh, Z direction and also in the uh, AB plane. So in this case, uh, if we do the calculation, we find uh, uh, again that if we incident the beam is not is not coincide with this uh, uh, red colored Fermi surface, is in this gray color region, then the uh, shift will be suppressed. So from, from measuring the shift, actually we can also extract information about uh, the Fermi surface in the superconducting side. So from this study, we have, uh, uh, we find that there is a, uh, a very interesting unconventional pairing induced uh, transverse shift in entry reflection. So this is uh, in contrast to the uh, previous work because previously we find that the shift is originated from the spin optic coupling on the normal metal, normal metal side. The, the superconducting side is more, play a more passive role. So it's, it's not very important, but uh, for unconventional pairing, we see that uh, the unconventional pair potential itself can produce uh, transverse shifts. And uh, the mechanism is uh, distinct because here the shift is, uh, is due to the change in this um, nambu pseudo spin. And uh, the spin of the company is not necessary, necess not necessary here. And uh, from the study, we can see the Induced the shift will exhibit a behavior that's very sensitive to the type of pairing. So for, for P wave, uh, chiral type, and D wave, they exhibit different patterns, uh, different period, different symmetry. So if one can indeed uh, probe this um, uh, transverse shift, it could be a very powerful tool to categorize superconductors. And uh, all the uh, all these previous works, uh, we focus on this transverse shift. Uh, we may also ask, uh, is there a longitudinal shift? Actually, in a previous work, this work back to 2013, uh, there is a, a study of this uh, longitudinal shift, or in other words, the ghost tension like shift uh, in uh, uh, scattering between the normal metal and the superconductor. But the but the results uh, in that work is uh, negative, so they do not find any longitudinal shifts. Uh, we find that actually there is a made uh, assumption here. So they assume that uh, the uh, Fermi energy uh, in this uh, system is uh, the largest energy scale, is uh, much larger than all other energy scales. Uh, but this may not be uh, um, may not be true in general, because uh, for example, if we consider uh, graphene and uh, you introduce uh, a superconducting gap through the proximity effect, in, in this case, the Fermi energy may not be uh, much larger than other energy scales. So we took this uh, uh, setup and we just study this um, 
this uh, is a graphing with a uh, approximate induced uh, superconductivity on one side and the normal metal on normal metal state on the other side. And indeed, we find there could be a sizable longitudinal shift. Now, because this is a 2D system, so the, there can only be a longitudinal shift. There is no transverse shift because you cannot move electron out of the plane, right? So here, we indeed find there are sizable shifts, the longitudinal shift. And uh, one important uh, observation is that uh, this, uh, uh, the sign of this shift actually correlates with uh, uh, the trajectory of this uh, reflected hole, of this reflected hole. Uh, in, the, in the graphene, there are two kinds of um, entry, entry reflection. Now, one, one is called the, the conventional retro reflection, which means the trajectory of the outgoing hole uh, traces uh, the, the trajectory of the incident electron. Uh, so they go almost parallel. Uh, the other is called the uh, specular reflection. Now, specular reflection just means uh, the, the, the reflected beam is uh, uh, follows the law of reflection like uh, for a light beam. Uh, so here, the incident electron go like this, and the outgoing hole will uh, go in this direction, not parallel to the incident beam. Uh, so physically, this is because um, in, in for this retro reflection, this is like an intraband uh, entry refraction process. So the incident electron and the outgoing hole, the, they both from the states of the same band. Uh, but uh, if you have an uh, interband process, if the incident electron and outgoing hole are from different bands, for example, when the Fermi energy is, uh, is high, uh, then this, um, there can occur this uh, so-called specular reflection. Uh, and we are finding that actually for the two types of reflection, the, the longitudinal shift will have different sign. Now, so for retro reflection, this is positive. For specular reflection, this is negative. So you see it illustrated in this uh, figures. So for retro refraction, it's a positive. Uh, and for the uh, specular refraction, this is negative. So the two uh, kind of features that are correlated uh, together in this particular system. Uh, so basically from this study, we can show, we show that the, the longitudinal shifts generally exist also in entry reflection. And uh, they can be enhanced by the pseudo spin bar freedom. Here, I didn't stress this point too much. Uh, this is uh, similar to the previous discussion of percentage shift in graphene. And uh, the pseudo spin bar freedom in graphene is, uh, uh, we can find that in this particular system, the pseudo spin can enhance this uh, size of the shifts. And uh, we also extend this study to uh, like a process, so-called cross entry reflection. So which means uh, you have a, a junction made of a normal metal and the superconductor and the normal metal. So this is a, like a sandwich structure. And you have an incident electron, for in, in, electron beam incident on one side, but the outgoing hole is on the other side. And for this uh, process, uh, uh, we can also demonstrate there is a sizable shift, uh, the sizable transfer shift in this process. Um, yeah, so that's uh, uh, that's one of the uh, topic we have uh, uh, studied is uh, the, uh, the, the, the anomalous shift in this entry refraction, uh, and. Uh, the second topic is about the quantization. So here we have a, we have a thing that uh, the shift is like a universal phenomenon right? for different types of uh, uh, reflection process, no matter it's a photon or electron, and whether it's normal reflection or entry reflection, we can all have this, this uh, uh, anomalous shift in this, um, uh, in this uh, uh, interface plane. So if we consider a very general uh, reflection process, so here we, we have a, a beam incident from so-called incident, incident medium onto this interface. 
and uh, the lower part is what we call the target median. And uh, the outgoing beam will have a shift from this incident beam on this interface. This shift is characterized by a vector L. Uh, we call it a shift vector. So in, in, in this picture, actually this L incorporates both the longitudinal shift components and also the transverse shift component. Uh, so we, we superpose both. Uh, this is uh, the shift vector. And uh, then we can have uh, a plot of this uh, shift in this, uh, um, in this uh, momentum space, the interface momentum space. So this Kx, Ky are the momentum uh, along the interface. Uh, so essentially we have a vector field, uh, a vector field plotted in this uh, momentum space. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, is there any special feature in this uh, vector field? So um, there's uh, some hints from previous study, uh, like in this, uh, in this work by a, a group from the Nyon Technological University. So they study a photonic crystal. Uh, they calculate, uh, theoretically calculate this uh, shift vector distribution. They find uh, that uh, uh, if there is a um, formiac, so basically this is also uh, like a wild and metal kind of median. Uh, and there could be a surface Fermi arc. They find that if there is a Fermi arc, the, the shift vector is like uh, forming a half vortex, right? Like forming half vortex. So this means the, the profile of this shift vector could uh, encode some interesting feature of the physical system. And uh, we also look at uh, the results from our study of the chiral P wave superconductor. So if we plot the shift vector for this chiral P wave superconductor in this Andrew refraction process, then you find something like this. So it's uh, like a, a vortex, right? It's like a vortex. The shift vector circulates around the center. And uh, talking about vortex, uh, um, uh, in physics, uh, we are, uh, uh, the thing we are familiar with is the vortex in the superfluid. And uh, in that um, context, we know that vortex is uh, quant quantized, which means if you integrate uh, the velocity vector around the vortex center, you find the circulation. The so-called circulation is uh, quantized in some fundamental units. So this n is an uh, integer. Uh, the reason is that the velocity vector is basically the gradient of the phase of the superfluid. So by integrating this, uh, this gradient of phase, you get the uh, uh, integer multiple of uh, two pi, right? So that's uh, the reason for this quantization of vortex in superfluid. So uh, here for this shift vector, we can derive a, a very general expression. Uh, so it's given by these this, uh, three terms. So here, the first two terms, this u are the periodic uh, part of the block wave function. Uh, so here, basically, we assume this uh, uh, both upside and down, lower side are uh, described by a certain uh, periodic lattice. So here, we have this uh, shell periodic part of the block wave function. Uh, so actually, this, if you are familiar with uh, the so called Barry phase and Barry connection, you find this actually is similar to the Barry connection in the direction of this K parallel. K parallel is the wave vector in the interface plane, in the interface plane. And uh, the last term is the uh, gradient of uh, uh, the phase of this reflection amplitude. So this R is the reflection amplitude. Uh, so, so here, this is the gradient of the phase. So this actually is uh, is actually similar to the thing here, right? So you have a, a gradient of some phase. So we can do an integration of this shift vector along a closed loop. Uh, and this we call the circulation of the shift. This we define the circulation of the shift. Uh, you can see that it will have two contributions. One is the integration of the first part. These two terms integrate along the loop. 
The second uh, term is the integration of this term. And this term, in, after integration, you know it's a quantized number. It's just a two in, integer multiple of two pi. And uh, if you want the circulation to be quantized, we need uh, the first term to be zero, to be zero. In general, it's not zero, but it can be zero in some special case, like in these two cases. One is uh, when the incident median is uh, uh, trivial. Trivial means uh, here means uh, uh, this um, barrier connection field is uh, zero. Uh, or if you, for this incident median, you have uh, a mirror plane parallel to the interface, then you can argue that the two terms actually cancel each other. And therefore this delta gamma also becomes zero. So in these two cases, we can have a, a quantized circulation of the shift. And uh, uh, okay, so it's quantized, but uh, is there any use of this? So does it manifest any physical properties of the medium we are probe? Uh, so here we, did a case study. We 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 use um, the vial using a vial medium. Yeah, so this uh, may be a vial side metal or a vial uh, photonic crystal or anything. So this vial medium has a, a vial point in this uh, band structure. And uh, for the incident medium, so this is our target medium. This is the medium we want to probe. For this uh, incident medium, we just uh, use a, a trivial medium. Uh, trivial means uh, it does not have any uh, kind of spin up coupling or anything, just like uh, uh, given by a very simple uh, semiconductor band structure or, or just uh, a free electron gas. Here we use a two band model because uh, we need to match the left hand side to the right hand side. Because here we use a two band model. But the lower band is really not necessary. So here we do this uh, calculation uh, to find the uh, 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 shift vector field. Um, you can see that uh, for this wild point, uh, wild point is enclosed in, in this uh, Fermi surface on the, on the uh, target median side. And uh, this, uh, you can see this shift vector field circulates around this region, uh, circulates around this region. So if we choose a closed loop, which is outside of the Fermi surface of this uh, target medium, then you can show that this circulation must uh, be given by minus two pi times uh, the topological charge of this wire point. Now, so if uh, uh, the wire point carries a topological charge uh, plus one or minus one, and this is uh, uh, correspond to so-called chain number enclosed, uh, defined on the surface enclosing this wire point. Uh, so here uh, we find the circulation directly manifests the topological charge of the wire point. Yeah, so this is a very interesting result. And uh, uh, this is uh, directly coming from the phase winding of this uh, reflection amplitude. So here we plot this uh, phase of this reflection amplitude for different uh, incident momentum. You can see there is indeed a phase winding around this point. So this is a, like a vertex core, right? So, so you can see this phase winding. And uh, more interestingly, if you increase the, the topological charge of wire points, so uh, you can have wire points with a multiple topological charge. Uh, these are so-called like uh, a double wire point or triple wire points. And uh, these are, uh, Studied have been studied in the condensed matter context. Now people find uh, certain crystals can host such kind of multi wire points. So here we take this uh, double wire and triple wire point as examples, and uh, you can show that this condition actually is uh, general. So if you have a mu larger than one, then the circulation will also get uh, uh, multiplied by this factor mu. So this is for uh, double wild points. Now, so you can see there are like two vertex cores, although the wild point is just a single point. Now, but in this region, you see it's, a, it's like having a two vertex in this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this Fermi surface bound of the, of the target media. And uh, this is for the triple wild point. 
So the, the, this result show that uh, actually from this uh, quantized uh, circulation, you can actually characterize the topological charge of uh, a material, of a medium. Uh, and uh, similarly, we did the study for superconductor. So we, we again repeat the calculation for chiral P wave. This is a figure we have shown. Uh, and also for D wave and S wave. Uh, only for the chiral type, you can find uh, non-trivial circulation. Uh, and again, this is given by a very similar expression. Uh, this chi is uh, the, the chirality of the uh, pairing. And uh, for other type, if there is no chirality, then the circulation is zero. So from this uh, result, we show that there is a, uh, first of all, quantized quantity in a, uh, almost a ubiquitous uh, uh, physical process that is the reflection of a, a particle at the interface. And uh, the sensor is quantized. So the, the result will not be sensitive to interface details. So like uh, in the, all this process, now for example, like here for this while, while same metal parts, if we modify this interface to make it uh, rough or add some disorders, add some surface potential, all these will perturbations will not change the circulation because this is quantized. Uh, so, so this is a very robust property. And uh, uh, also we show that this can be a, a, a way to characterize the topology of the media. Like for wild and metals, it captures the topological charge, right? For chiral superconducting materials, it, it characterizes the property of uh, uh, superconductivity in the material. And uh, finally, I, I mentioned the possible experimental setup for the detection. Uh, so of course, to control the electron beam is, uh, is not an easy task, although there are uh, important progress in the last 20 years, which uh, actually form a field called uh, so-called electron optics. Uh, electron optics, people are trying to form the electron beam and manipulating the beam. Uh, here we propose a much simpler setup without the requirement of, uh, of forming a collimated beam. So here we, we can construct a junction. Uh, so this is a junction between a normal metal and uh, an unconventional superconductor, maybe a cuprate. And uh, the, the important thing is you make a, a, a wedge. So this, uh, this interface has a, a final angle with uh, the electron flow. So electron flow is from left to right. Now on average, it's from left to right. And you make this interface, which having a final angle with this electron flow. Then our, uh, from our calculation, we predict that there will be a shift uh, on average for this uh, electron beam in one way. So uh, of course, this depends on the orientation of this uh, uh, crystal axis with respect to this, uh, this plane. You can have, uh, uh, for some angle, it may be going up. For some angle, it will be going down, which is uh, depending on the angle alpha in our previous discussion. Now, but anyway, there is going to be a, on average, a shift for the electrons uh, during this uh, refraction process. So the result is you have charge accumulation on the, uh, between the, on the top surface and the bottom surface, and they will be of the opposite sign. So if you have a positive charge accumulated on the top surface, it will be negative charge accumulated on the, on the bottom surface. This can be measured as a, a voltage difference. Uh, when you have a probe uh, close to the interface and on the normal metal side. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a, a possible experimental setup to detect the effects we predicted. So in summary, I have uh, uh, introduced uh, our previous works on uh, discovery of new effects in energy refraction. That is, uh, you can have a, a sizable anomalous shifts uh, in energy refraction for the reflected uh, for the reflected whole beam uh, in, with respect to the incident electron beam. And uh, this shift uh, has uh, both components uh, uh, in, the in the plane of incidence and the transverse to the plane of incidence. And uh, for the general problem of the uh, interface, shifting the interface refraction, 
we find that the, in certain condition, under certain conditions, this uh, shift uh, vector field can be uh, can have a quantized circulation, and this may produce a robust uh, signal to be detected in experiments, and it can be used to probe the uh, property of the media. Okay, so that's all for my talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Shengyang. Let me stop recording.